All right, I think we can get it started. So hello everyone, um, welcome to ethics seminar series. This is John, I'm the seminar coordinator and together with me is Ms. Kelly Melody. She's our communication and IT specialist. Kathy and I will be today's moderator. Just so you know that the seminar is being recorded. Uh, the presentation will be uh, uploaded to our YouTube channel. And you are welcome to bring up um, questions after the speaker's presentation. And today we are excited to have our speaker, um, Professor um, O. Gorman, joining us from MIT. So Professor um, Paul O'Gorman is a professor of atmospheric science at MIT. His research is motivated by the need to understand how the hydrologic cycle and atmospheric circulation respond to climate change. Particular areas of interest include the extratropical storm tracks, moist um, convection, and extreme precipitation. In addition to developing theory and analyzing simulation and observations, his research group is working to improve climate model through machine learning. Okay, so let's welcome the speaker and I will give the floor to um, the um, speaker. So professor, please proceed. Great. Thanks, John, and uh, thanks everyone for attending. Uh, today I'm going to talk about um, using machine learning to improve uh, climate modeling and predictions. Um, and I'm also going to motivate this uh, by my kind of other main research area in, in studying precipitation and how it responds to climate change. And both of these will be very linked. Um, so yeah, I'm, I'm, I work at MIT. Uh, and a lot of this research is done with Yanni Yuval, who's a postdoc here who works in machine learning and climate. And also, I thank uh, several other collaborators listed there, and also uh, funding support from the NSF, um, MIT, and also uh, Schmidt Futures. So, yeah, in, in motivating uh, why we might care about precipitation and its extreme uh, values, um, well, we know that it has major impacts on people, on landscapes, including, for example, true landslides on and on ecosystems. For example, if rainfall is heavy or moderate or light, these have big effects on ecosystems. And the graphic there is from extreme uh, rainfall event uh, that famously occurred in July in China. Um, there was also in the same month, one in, in Europe, in Western Europe was very severe. And we also know from the US, we've had uh, extreme rainfall earlier this year. And also, uh, you know, in terms of record breaking, events Harvey in 2017. So we know that uh, precipitation events have a big impacts on us, on society, and also landscapes and ecosystems. So it's something we're very interested to model. In terms of observations, um, we can see, for example, that precipitation extremes are intensifying at a global level. And this is a, a graph I made for a review a few years ago where I took aggregated uh, rain gauge data from around the world um, and looking over about 100 years at, at stations with at least 30 years of data. And what's considered here is the annual maximum daily precipitation. So that's a one in 365 um, event. So it's not so extreme, but certainly unusual for a given day. Um, and then what's plotted is how that's changed um, in percent uh, per Kelvin or degree Celsius warming over that period, and it's per global warming. And so by aggregating it in lat latitude bands, you can actually increase the signal to noise. And what you can see is that over the uh, Northern hemisphere, there's a positive signal. And in particular, it's fairly well constrained, uh, you know, between about 40 and 60 degrees latitude. Whereas in the tropics, it's very uncertain. The dash lines, the 90% confidence interval, and there's not many gauges we can use in the southern hemisphere also. So we have a sense that rainfall extremes in this case are increasing in intensity um, at this kind of very, very global scale. But of course, we would like to know what's happening regionally and what will, will happen regionally. 
Um, so if you turn now to, in this case, global climate models and uh, look at, you know, a similar statistic, again, the change in annual maximum daily precipitation per Kelvin global warming, but now mapping it regionally, um, here stippling indicates model agreement. What you can see is that there's increases over most parts of the world, except some regions of the subtropical oceans in these models. But there are fairly large differences in the rate of intensification. For example, over India, you see larger uh, rate of increase, uh, some parts of the ocean. And for example, in North America, you see a, a, a slightly stronger rate of increase over the East Coast. Um, and that's actually something we see in observations also over the last, um, say, 100 years. Uh, there's a much greater increase over the eastern part of the U.S. than over the western part of the U.S., which hasn't seen much of an increase. But that's strongly affected by unforced variability. But even when we take many climate models and, you know, reduce the unforced variability and see the signal as well as we can, as you do here, you can see there's large variations. And that's particularly true, actually, if you look seasonally. So, for example, if you look in northern summer, June, July, August, um, Again, this is the change in annual maximum daily precipitation for Kelvin warming. Um, you see really large changes. So, for example, over North America, there's very little change in these models. Uh, you might find that surprising. Um, also, over Europe, there's negative changes over the Mediterranean. And then this season um, in the Southern Hemisphere, now winter, uh, again, uh, negative changes over parts of Southern Africa, for example. And so there's a very interesting large scale pattern that we really don't understand very well. We know it's due to dynamical changes in the extreme events in these models, but why it's happening is, is not well understood and is quite important. Um, and in particular, um, the uncertainty is very large in the tropics and global models. Here is showing the standard deviation of the change across models. And you can see there's a huge variance in the models where in the tropics where convection is dominant. Um, and so this kind of global model, as we'll discuss, is not, is not doing well. Uh, it's highly dependent on its convection scheme. And you could say something similar about Northern Hemisphere summer in regions where mesoscale convective systems are very important. You again would have reason to distrust such global models uh, as we'll see again. So I, I think there's value in the global models in showing these large scale patterns, um, but there's a lot of uncertainty. And the difficulty in modeling of precipitation in global models and in regional models that are not convection permitting, it largely comes from the representation of subgrid moist convection. So on the left, we can see a nice picture taken from the ISS of convection over West Africa very large anvil cloud, and we can see, you know, different cumulus clouds at different stages of development. And on the right is, uh, you know, a classic paper by Araco and Schubert of how to represent subgrid convection based on an ensemble of entraining plumes. So this would be in one grid box in a model. You have many different um, uh, convecting elements. And there's a couple of things that go into, so this is a, a wonderful paper, a great achievement, but nonetheless does introduce errors. There's two kind of errors. One is you have to make some assumption about statistical uh, quasi-equilibrium as it's called. So there's some simplifying assumption that may not be very accurate. Um, and secondly, you're representing clouds by plumes and we basically know that's not a very good approximation, although it is useful. So this is how, we represent convection when we can't resolve it. Um, and we can see how that kind of representation affects um, the intensity distribution of precipitation in this paper by Wilcox and Donner in 2007. Um, so what's plotted is the frequency of rain rate in grid cells at the size of a grid cell in a climate model. Um, and so the x-axis is the grid cell rain rate and then the observations, which are coming from satellite SM, SMI and TMI, I believe, um, you see that the observed distribution, and then you see a model run with two different convection schemes. 
and I'm not picking on these convection schemes, uh, you'd see something similar with many other convection schemes. Uh, when I say convection scheme, I mean parameterization, the subgrid parameterization of convection, like we saw on the previous plot, uh, slide. And you can see they have very, very different um, distributions of the rainfall uh, rate. This is over tropical land, but it would look similar over ocean also. Um, and so you can see very large errors at both low and high rain rates. Um, so in these models, for example, heavy precipitation would be greatly underestimated. However, there are other models where it's greatly overestimated, actually. Um, and it's not just about the heavy precipitation, which we've talked a little bit about already, but also at the low end of the moderate precipitation events. And unsub unsurprisingly, the convection scheme also strongly affects relative humidity patterns, uh, the static stability, that is kind of the thermal stratification of the atmosphere. These are all affected by convection schemes, and this has been documented documented in many papers. Interestingly, it's a little bit more controversial how much um, subgrid uh, convection schemes matter for the time mean precipitation pattern. Um, this is a paper where um, a few different models, four different models were put into a very idealized configuration, just an aqua planet over a prescribed sea surface temperature distribution that's uh, symmetric about the equator. And then they were warmed up at the surface, and you can see there's vastly different changes in precipitation, timing precipitation now between these four models. Um, but this is a, a very sensitive setup, actually, um, for, for example, how the intertropical convergence zone organizes itself. And some other papers argue that the mean precipitation distribution is not as sensitive um, to the convection scheme, although it does it is somewhat sensitive and it does care about other subgrid parameterizations, for example, glandular uh, turbulence and so on. Um, so that's a little bit less clear compared to the intensity distribution, but there certainly is some sensitivity there. So what do we do about this? Well, the obvious thing to do in a way is to move to global convection resolving sim simulations, or sometimes people call them storm resolving simulations because we're not really resolving everything about the convection. And then you turn off at least your deep convection scheme. And so this could be at a grid spacing of maybe four kilometers or, or ideally smaller. And so what's shown here on the left is some satellite observations of a cloud scene on the 4th of August, 2016. And then on the right, the SAM um, System for Atmospheric Modeling, a global model, which is a model I'll talk about later. Um, on the same day, it's about 76 hours after initialization, so the patterns match up. And this was written about in the context of a Palmer Turing test, the idea being if models become realistic enough, can you actually tell the difference in this case in the, in the cloud field? And it's pretty hard to do so. And then if you look at things like the precipitation distribution in terms of intensity, it's also much improved compared to global models. But you have to go to this uh, convection permitting scale, which is very expensive. Um, and that's a problem for studies of climate, not so much studies of weather in most cases, because uh, we have very long time scales in the climate system. So here's a classic paper that looks at this question by Stufer, um, where they took a global climate model, doubled the CO2 suddenly, and then watch the temperature respond, or half the CO2 and watch the temperature respond. And what's plotted is the Northern Hemisphere temperature averaged over the whole hemisphere at the surface, or the Southern Hemisphere temperature. And they're both put on the doubling and halving of CO2 are put on the same scale by just plotting it as the fraction of the total response. And what's striking, if you haven't seen this kind of graph before, is just how long it takes for just the surface temperature, don't mind the deep ocean, to equilibrate. Um, and, you know, some models might be a bit quicker, but this, basically this is what we have, and, you know, it's maybe a thousand years. So we need to run models for a very long time uh, for climate, for different multiple ensembles, for different types of experiments, uh, you know, so we, ha we have a lot of uses for climate models that we need to run them for a very long time, whereas convection resolving globally, we can run for, you know, say 60 days or maybe a year, that kind of thing. We'll soon be able to run them for more than that, but it's still very different from what uh, standard 
runs of global climate models are. Um, and then I should also mention regional, you can at regional scale go to convection resolving, of course, and this is very hope, helpful for impacts studies, um, local impact studies. For example, here's a nice paper by Andy Reinadal looking at North America in what's called pseudo global warming experiments where you take reanalysis uh, for the boundary conditions and as a kind of a, a relaxation throughout the domain and then you add kind of artificially add a warming and a moistening of the atmosphere and this is looking at the changes in mean and extreme rainfall but these of course as well known also have some limitations due to the presence of the boundaries due to inheriting biases from the driving global model which itself has a convection scheme so that's going to strongly influence everything in the regional model too and then from the point of view of somebody might, like me who's trying to understand from a science scientific point of view the global response it's very hard to put together these um, small domain uh, well this is rather large domain but often small domain simulations from around the world to understand the big patterns we saw for example for the JGA response of extreme precipitation there was clearly these very large scale patterns that it would be much easier to understand in a, a global uh, simulation oops sorry so the current situation then is we have subgrid parameterizations based on simplified physical models to represent things like subgrid convection and other subgrid processes and so our climate model on the right is a combination of the laws of physics as we know them for resolved motions so for example fluid dynamics and then these subgrid parameterizations which are usually evaluated one grid cell at a time and so what's been proposed uh, now for a number of years is to a different way forward where we take advantage of the high resolution models shown on the left I use machine learning to learn a new parameterization for subgrid processes um, that could occur in one grid cell or maybe more than one. We still use the laws of physics as we know them for the uh, large scale resolved motions. And so then we'd have a hybrid machine learning, physics, um, chemistry, et cetera, model or earth system model or atmospheric model or oceanic model. And so what might that look like? Well, if you were considering one uh, grid box in the horizontal, and then we look, usually it's proposed to do this all vertical levels at once. Um, subgrid convection that's not resolved might in general warm uh, the atmosphere and dry it out at the same time if it's deep convection. And so that's the drying is shown in the blue line and the warming is shown in the red line. And we have some estimate of what these what we would call tendencies or time rates of change from subgrid processes should be and that's shown in in the solid red for example from a high resolution model or perhaps inferred from observations and then we have a prediction for example by a neural net um, that gives the dashed red line so it's a, a supervised learning task um, and so that would be one way to formulate the problem and so there's some opportunities that come from this approach. Uh, and I've listed a bunch of different papers going back to Kosnopolsky et al. And, and there's been a lot of papers recently. It's, you know, I could have expanded this list by another 10 or 20 papers, no problem. Um, so what, what are the advantages or opportunities? Well, one is that I think it's been pretty convincingly shown that the accuracy can be higher uh, for machine learning based parameterizations. Um, there are also, at least for deep convection, I should say, uh, there's also a possibility of more flexible structure. So, you know, the traditional approach for convection, for example, is to consider one column of the atmosphere, vertical column, at one time. Um, and so we don't have to follow that. We could use multiple columns, we can use the past history, uh, things like that. And then lastly, there's the possibility of actually learning new physics from these parameterizations. They're really mappings that tell us about how subgrid um, processes lead to large scale um, tendencies, as we, I call them. And so we could interrogate that mapping and try and understand more about that, um, 
or perhaps fit new equations as being tried equation discovery. However, there is also some challenges uh, that have emerged again in, in very, very recently. One is that when you put a machine learning parameterization and couple it into a climate model, you've got this new dynamical system and it can become unstable. Um, so you can get a blow up, uh, say in the middle attitudes. Um, and in ways that don't necessarily seem to occur with traditional parameterizations. Another problem that's been found in some cases, not all, is that um, the parameterization may work well for on a weather forecast time scale, maybe for 10 days, but if you try to run it a longer time um, in a, a climate model, for example, it's, it suffers from bad climate drift. It just becomes inaccurate, even though it seems to be accurate on short time scales. Uh, another problem is generalization. So a machine learning parameterization trained in one climate will not necessarily work in another climate, say a warmer climate. Now that is important if we want to learn, for example, from observations or reanalysis. Um, and then lastly, conservation. Uh, machine learning parameterization will not necessarily conserve water or energy or give you, for example, non-negative precipitation, various properties that we would like to see uh, you know, that we know are true of the real world and we would like to see them in, in our models. And I should say some of these are related. For example, if you don't have conservation, perhaps you won't have stability, or at least it won't be as robust as it would be otherwise. So I've talked a lot already, but I'd like to, for the remainder of the talk, I'm going to talk about two basic things. One, I'm going to just talk about what we've been doing here in my group uh, as an approach to machine learning parameterization that works well for both mean and extreme precipitation and we, that we find so far at least a stable and robust and does things like conserving energy and water. So I just want to kind of give you, walk through what we've been doing so far. And then I'll have a more general discussion of, you know, some questions at the frontiers of this type of approach and whether it can improve um, climate modeling. So we have a test bed we've been working with uh, to try and develop these parameterizations. It's the same model I showed earlier, the SAM model of Rat Rudinov. And, and we put it in an idealized uh, setting so as, you know, to make life a bit easier in developing these parameterizations. So we call it a quasi-global domain. It's, it's not the whole earth, but it's big enough to include both tropical dynamics. You can see the tropical rain bands there and extropical baroclinic eddies, cyclones, anticyclones, et cetera. In this particular configuration, it doesn't have tropical cyclones, although you can get them pretty easily by just moving the maximum in sea surface temperature off the equator. Um, and then we do one other trick uh, that's important to mention is that, as I mentioned before, you would normally want to go to at least four kilometer grid spacing or lower to resolve convection. But there's this approach called hypohydrostatic rescaling, where you modify your equations of motion. And effectively, what it does is leaves the large scale dynamics unchanged, but these convective scale becomes larger. And so we can get away with a grid spacing, we think, of about 12 kilometers and still uh, resolve convection. Um, and you can also view this as changing kind of the properties of the earth. So you could have a realistic system that would, would have these properties. Um, so I, I believe, you know, everything I'm talking about will, would apply if, if it went down to three kilometers, but the tests we've done are in this hypohydrostatic rescaled um, model. Um, so one question you might have is, well, how does this model do? It's in an idealized, over an idealized sea surface temperature distribution, the QOBS distribution. Um, so, you know, there's only some limited tests we can do, but one thing we can look at is how does the precipitation distribution look like, the intensity, because we know that's a big failing, uh, particularly in the tropics for current global climate models. And so that's what's shown on the left here is the frequency distribution of the precipitation rate in the tropics. Um, the trim 3B42 estimates uh, from observations are in red. Uh, the green line is or a simulation I've just been talking about, uh, which matches pretty well, except at the very, very highest percentiles. And then the blue line, just for reference, is the CESM, the NCAR model, um, over the same part of the Pacific as the, um, this is over the ocean, I should say, as the uh, trim 
uh, data set is taking, uh, trim observations are taken from. And you can see it has a very different uh, precipitation distribution, consistent with the results from Wilcox and Donner I showed you earlier. Um, and so we're, we're definitely doing better than that particular GCM for the precipitation rate distribution. And then, you know, we're also interested in the organization of convection. So I'm just plotting here on the right um, uh, distribution of the area of convecting clusters. So the, actually these are precipitating clusters. So this gives you some sense of how a basic sense of how the precipitation is organized um, spatially. And what you typically see in this kind of distribution is a roughly a power law distribution and then a roll off at very high areas. So cluster size here means area. Again, the red is the observations from trim 3B42. Green is our model, uh, SAM model in this idealized domain. Um, and then CSM is shown in blue. Um, and CSM has a much, uh, it's not as fine resolution. So here, you know, that's very obvious as a smaller distribution, but a range of distribution. Uh, but also you'll notice the power of approximate power law range is very different. Um, whereas the other two, the model and the trim 3D42 give a similar power law exponent at one point, minus 1.7. And uh, now it is true though, that the R simulation, the green line, um, falls off quicker at the very largest cluster areas. And that kind of makes sense because that now goes back to how your ITCC is distributed. Um, we don't have something like the West Pacific warm pool, things like that, which tend to get very large clusters. Uh, so I, I think that's expected, but nonetheless, from, you know, for an idealized simulation, I think it's, it's doing a pretty good job. Okay, so we can run this model and we can plot here the mean precipitation versus latitude and also precipitation extremes. Um, here are the one in a thousand event for three hourly precipitation. The blue line is what we're calling this high resolution model. And then if we run it without adding any scheme, um, any extra parameterization at eight times coarser resolution, you get the green line. And so what happens is you switch from a essentially a double ITCZ high resolution to a single ITCZ with very, very strong um, rain rates. So what's happening is instability is building up the grid set, cell, a lot of cape drops, and you get kind of grid point storms that are very large. Um, so this is common in other models also, if you run them without a convection scheme. You might say, well, why don't we add a, a standard convection scheme when we thought about that, uh, one problem is this model doesn't have one implemented in a standard way, but we could have added one. The biggest problem is that depending on the convection scheme we added, we would, got, would have got almost any answer, uh, almost any answer, but a huge range of answers. And so the result would have been very dependent on which one we chose to add. And so we decided not to for that reason. Um, when you run in this setup uh, where we've prescribed sea surface temperature distribution that's symmetric about the equator aquaplanet mode, it becomes very sensitive, as I mentioned earlier, to the representation of subgrid processes. So here's a paper from a number of years back by Mobus and Stevens, where they show that, you know, depending on the model they look at, you can get a single ITCZ, double ITCZ, and a range of behaviors. This is just the mean precipitation. So uh, I just want to kind of emphasize the fact there's a double ITCZ is, is peculiar to this exact um, setup we have. Um, if you change it a little bit, other people have shown you do actually get a single ITCZ. So it's not necessarily incorrect. Normally we would think of a double ITCZ as being a problem because that's a bias many global models have, but that's for the real world with, with very different um, SST distribution. Okay, so on to the machine learning part. Um, so what we do is we then train the parameterization uh, for use in course simulations, we coarse grain by over eight by eight uh, grid cell blocks. So for example, if you take the precipital water over here, and I just zoomed in on part of the tropics, and then we coarse grain it, and it looks like this. And so we're gonna learn what correction is needed to dynamics um, to make those still accurate, have the right kind of dynamics. And it doesn't look like much, uh, it's coarse grain by factor of eight, so 64 overall in area. But this, of course, has a huge effect on the speed at which you can run the model. 
And we calculate subgrid terms for many processes, including cloud and precipitation, microphysics, fluxes of energy and moisture by protection, uh, boundary layer tur turbulence and radiation. All of these things change as you coarse grain up. And so we have some corrections for them, plus uh, surface fluxes. So the approach we found has worked so far is we calculate the subgrid terms exactly by coarse graining the equations as a model process by process. So this is kind of a labor intensive process, a uh, labor intensive way of doing it, uh, but it does allow you to treat each process differently. And that, as you'll see, allows us to make sure everything's physically consistent. An alternative is to run for say five minutes or half an hour and then get the difference of the states at the start and the end between a coarse and a high resolution model and work out what a correction would be. Uh, that doesn't allow you to separate different processes and may lead to other problems with accuracy. So we've gone with this more labor intensive approach where we actually coarse grain the model exactly. And then we have two different ways of trying to conserve energy and water. Uh, depends on their machine learning algorithm. If we know, use a neural net, uh, what we do is we predict the fluxes up and down and sources and sinks, say auto conversion of water, uh, rather than just predicting the net tendency at each level. And this is good because once you put everything in terms of fluxes and sources and sinks, then you can automatically conserve energy, for example, you guarantee it or momentum or whatever you're doing. Although you have to predict more numbers than you would have to if you just wanted to say, what's the net change in temperature from separate processes. On the other hand, if we use what's called a random forest, which is another machine learning approach, uh, then it automatically uh, can be designed so as it automatically conserves energy or satisfies properties like non-negative precipitation. And that's because the prediction in that case is uh, not a fitted function, but rather it's averages over subsets of the training data you're using. And if the training data itself conserves energy and water and you know, to the extent you have a linear property there, when you average over some of the training data, you still satisfy that property. For example, if all of the training data samples have non-negative precipitation, as you'd like, then the average over them will have non-negative precipitation. I'll just briefly mention what a random forest is because um, probably most people are familiar with artificial neural nets, but maybe not random forests. So, it's an ensemble of decision trees. Uh, one small decision tree is shown here. The idea is you start at the top and you have a variable, it could be temperature. If it's less than a certain value, you go left. If it's greater, you go right. And you use different inputs um, randomly chosen to some extent. And then you go keep going down until you get to a leaf of the tree where the prediction is made, as I mentioned, as a subset of the data. So this would be one decision tree that would be normally much bigger than this. And then you take an average over, um, you, you randomly, you randomize the generation of them in terms of the data use and other, other, other aspects. So you have say 10 decision trees and then you can average the results of those, which uh, improves the prediction, uh, improves its ability to generalize. Um, so that's what a random forest is. And as I say, that has nice properties already, although it has one disadvantage is you have to store these big trees, which could be a problem you have to store them on many processors uh, on a supercomputer, so it could use a lot of memory. But there is a lot of attractive properties of this because it's it can't go too badly wrong. If you, for example, go outside the training data, it still predicts something from within the convex hull of the training data, uh, which I think helps with robustness. Uh, for the neural net parameterization, now we're we're fitting a function, um, and so we have to be careful to conserve energy and water and so on. And so I'm just showing the structure of our parameterization and I don't expect you to take this all in. I just want to give you a sense of what it looks like. So we actually have two neural nets. One predicts tendencies of say energy or water um, and fluxes um, of energy and water. And where possible, we make sure it's physically consistent. For example, if we have a tendency of water due to cloud microphysics, we may be able to derive exactly what the tendency should be of energy for that process. And when we can, we do that rather than uh, allowing them to be inconsistent. And then we have a second neural net, which takes slightly different inputs, includes winds, for example, and predicts adjustments to the surface fluxes and to the turbulent diffusivity. And so those depend more on the winds, for example, we found 
and so they get different inputs. And so this is all constructed to try to be physically consistent. Uh, the random forest was in from scikit-learn, and we trained the neural net in PyTorch. Um, and sometimes people ask, well, how do you deal with, you know, climate models are often written in Fortran. So what we do is we train in, in Python, essentially in PyTorch, uh, then export the weights or the trees or whatever they are uh, in just in an .cdf, CDF file, which we then read in uh, in Fortran 90 and implement the same algorithms, which is fairly easy actually in Fortran 90. Um, so they're just part of the standard model, SAM in our case, or a GCL. So I encourage you to read this paper uh, by Yuval Adal, if you'd like to read, learn more about the details, or you can ask at the end. Um, okay, so we put in our parameterization. Um, here is a snapshot of water, precipitable water in the high resolution simulation. Here it is in the coarse resolution with this overly strong single ITCZ. Um, and then we add our neural net parameterization. It doesn't slow down the model much, um, it's usually pretty quick. Um, and doesn't uh, the neural net doesn't take up much memory either. And so if I just run it forward, we started at the end of the course resolution run. Um, this one's a movie, and you can see how it's evolving. Uh, it's a chaotic system, but you can see it's already changing. The neural net parameterization is making a difference. Uh, it's particularly obvious, I think, in the tropics as the rain bands separate towards what the high resolution simulation has. And so these shouldn't match exactly because these are, you know, these are climate runs essentially, not better forecast, but it's, you know, it's doing a good job. We can also look at the statistics. So here's mean precipitation versus latitude. Um, the high resolution or target, if you will, is in blue. Uh, the coarse resolution in green without any scheme. And then when we add, in this case, a random forest, um, you get the orange dashed dotted line, um, which is much improved just in the tropics. In the extropics, it doesn't make too much difference. Um, and it's similar with the neural net, I'm not showing that here. And uh, I was very impressed when I saw this first, the, uh, the precipitation, extreme precipitation, the one in a thousand event, or the 99.9% .9 I'll have three hourly precipitation, uh, is really doing well with this, uh, with this random forest parameterization in particular. This is amazingly good. Uh, uh, match to what the high resolution simulation is doing. Okay, so that's that's the approach we've been doing, and we're you know trying to extend that. We're now trying to learn from a global, fully global uh, four kilometer run SAM with land and so on. We're also starting to look at you know introducing the parameterizations into um, CESM or other climate models. So this is a kind of an ongoing project. Um, so I'd like to just talk now for the rest of the time on some frontier questions um, about whether these kind of machine learning parameterizations could be used to improve weather and climate models. So one interesting question is, well, what if you're at a resolution, model resolution, where you're not fine enough to resolve convection? Assume you're not using this hypo hydrostatic trick we mentioned before, but you know, so you know, you'd like, you know, you think convection is resolved at one kilometer and you're at, you know, eight kilometers or something like that. Uh, so you're not, you can't turn your convection scheme off, but you're too coarse for traditional assumptions like convective quasi-equilibrium to apply. Uh, so this is a known problem. This is called the gray zone. Sometimes uh, people are working on making scale-aware parameterizations, traditional parameterizations to deal with this. It's difficult though, because a lot of the assumptions you'd like to use may not work so well in this intermediate zone. Um, and machine learning on the face of it would, is, is really suited to this because, well, you can just train at different coarse graining factors, right? You don't, you're not tied to any one physical law, et cetera. So you can just do your best at each coarse graining factor, or you could train on a bunch of different resolutions and make the resolution input to the neural net, for example. I don't think anyone's tried that yet, but I think it'd be very interesting to see if that worked. However, there is actually a question, maybe the gray zone is just fundamentally a problem, right? Maybe you, there isn't a good parameterization in the gray zone. So this is something we looked into in our, our test bed simulation, and we haven't found a gray zone actually. In fact, we find the parameterization works really well 
when there's not, you know, when the coarse graining factor is small. So here's an example of the coarse graining factor of four, high resolution simulations in blue, and then coarser by a factor of four in orange. And this is as good as you get it. It's actually better than you get a factor of eight or a factor of 16, probably because you're just have less subgrid physics to worry about. And what you do have um, works pretty well online. If you look at the offline, you know, just not running the model, but seeing how accurate the parameterization is on data um, at any instant, this actually does get worse when you only have these small coarse graining factors. But that seems to be just because there's a lot of noise um, that you don't seem to have to <laughs> deal with. Although, of course, people have found advantages to stochastic parameterizations. Uh, so interestingly, we are not finding a gray zone so far, but we haven't got a perfect test here because we have this hypohydrostatic prescaling and so forth. So this is something that should be looked into more, uh, but it could be a good advantage of machine learning uh, approaches. What about extrapolating to a future warmer climate? Let's say if we train on the current climate, you know, we would normally use a subgrid parameterization or a climate model in a warmer climate because we have confidence in the physics we put into the model, although we may worry because we've tuned it to certain field campaigns in the current climate. What about machine learning? If we train on the current climate and we go to a warmer climate, what happens? Well, this is something we looked into a few years ago in an idealized test where we trained our machine learning algorithm to replicate um, an existing convection scheme. So it's kind of a perfect model test. And we looked at the change in, we trained in a controlled climate and we did a big global warming of 6.5 Kelvin. And we said, okay, how, what, what happens? And what happens is it doesn't work. Uh, so the black line is what the original convection scheme gives. And then when you run the model with the random forest emulator, it really fails in the tropics, not so much in the extropics. And that's because in the tropics, you're seeing temperatures, humidities, uh, tropovols heights that you've never seen before. Uh, the machine learning algorithm is extrapolating, which they don't do well on, and it fails. However, if you train on samples, train one parameterization on samples from the current climate and the future climate, and then use that one parameterization in both climates, it works well. Um, so that's what we see here. So that basically says if you can, you know, run your high-resolution model, say your convection resolving model, in for a short period of time, say a year or two in the warmer climate, uh, and then use that training data, then you should be in okay shape. And actually, Stefan Rasp et al. 2018 showed that furthermore, you know, you can train on a current climate and a warmer climate and then apply it to intermediate climates, and that still works fine. Uh, so that's okay. Um, it does rule out learning from observations or reanalysis. However, Tom Buchler um, has a new paper that's about to be submitted with a bunch of co-authors, including Yanni and myself, um, and very nicely shows that you can, if you choose your inputs carefully, so for example, relative humidity instead of specific humidity, buoyancy instead of temperature, then these um, neural net parameterizations do generalize much better to warmer climates. Uh, so that's an interesting ongoing research area. So that would again open up the possibility of learning from observations or reanalysis, at least, um, or in addition. Um, however, even if that doesn't pan out fully, I think the fact you can learn from high resolution simulations that are fairly short in a warmer climate means that you're still okay. Okay, uh, this one's getting a little bit into the weeds, but I think it's actually quite important, so I wanted to mention it. Um, Machine learning algorithms like neural nets can be run on processors like uh, GPUs or TPUs, uh, tensor processing units, that uh, often use much reduced numerical precision to represent floating point numbers. And so you're, you're kind of deliberately using a, a representation that's not as accurate or as precise. Um, you might say, well, why would you do this? Well, the reason is, of course, it, it saves on storage memory storage, uh, the energy cost of running, you know, in our case, it would be supercomputers, uh, many fossil fuel emissions involved in that. Um, and it also increases speed. So there's some trade off as to, you know, how much it increases speed versus the other things, but there can be big advantages. Uh, so here's an example, um, for example, 
models currently will often use single precision 32 bits or double precision uh, even uh, in many cases. Uh, whereas on these other processors you can use, for example, half precision. This B float 16 only uses 16 bits. Um, that's brain floating point. Uh, that's what the B stands for. It comes from Google originally. And so that is, it's got the same dynamic range, the exponent, or the same range, overall range of numbers is not a problem, but the, what we call the mantissa, or what's called here the fraction, uh, has much fewer uh, bits. So we tried, looked into whether this could work in our case. Uh, could this work for weather and climate? Uh, and it, probably the answer is yes. ECMWF just switched to using single precision or using double precision. But here we're going to half precision, right? So we tried reducing the precision of the inputs and outputs of the neural net parameterization to bfloat 16, which roughly speaking is half precision. Um, and what you see is the frequency distribution of precipitation. Uh, 32 bits single precision is in orange. Gray is 16 bits, so that's bfloat 16. B float 16 is essentially indistinguishable. And just to so show you can actually finally run into problems if you go down to 10 bits, which is only two bits in the mantis, which is really very few. Now you start to see a difference. So this is encouraging that these kind of reduced precision um, uh, modes of, of, of processors could be very useful. I mentioned for people who are interested in this, Peter Dugan has a number of papers on this topic, not necessarily related to machine learning, but the issue of precision in, um, in modeling for weather and climate. Okay, just quickly mention one more, couple more things. Um, a lot of these studies for the atmosphere are focused on temperature and moisture, but we also care about momentum, uh, transport by convection and gravity waves. So here's an organized convective system. It's tilted. Uh, related to the shear. And so upward moving air is moving left. Uh, so you get a negative um, left on this plot, uh, but a negative momentum flux. Um, and also this convection is generating gravity waves, which are going to also transport momentum potentially. So this is a, a much, in some ways, much more difficult problem um, than the temperature and moisture. Uh, we've looked into this with our neural net parameterization predicting separate momentum fluxes. Here's the mean fluxes, the true fluxes according to the high-res model. So they're upwards here and downwards, depending on the shear, you would expect them to be different. And here's what we predict. So it's actually pretty good for the mean flux. However, the skill is lower than for temperature and moisture on say an hour to hour basis. And that's largely because it's difficult to predict the sign of the momentum flux. Um, so, oops, sorry. So if we go back to the schematic, if this had been tilted earlier in its evolution um, more to the right on this graph, the person to the right, the momentum flux would have opposite sign, whereas the energy and moisture fluxes would still be the way, the way they were before. And so you have to know something about the organization of convection, how it's evolving. Um, and so that's much more difficult, but perhaps different approaches to machine learning would do better on that. We're already doing okay for the mean fluxes, but it's definitely an interesting and, and difficult problem that matters a lot for a lot of phenomena in the atmosphere. And then the last thing I'll just mention is the going beyond the traditional approach of only considering one atmospheric column at one time. Uh, so in work with Pedong Wong at MIT and Yani, um, we've looked at making things non-local in space. So not considering, for example, just one column but now maybe nine columns or more uh, columns, um, so it's non-local, and including that information in your prediction for subgrid uh, tendencies. And what we find is it does improve the predictions in, in particular cases, so kind of in interesting ways it helps. And this isn't something that's not done in traditional schemes at all, right? So not to my knowledge, I don't think it's really been tried. Um, so that's interesting. So we can go beyond uh, the whole, the whole structure that's been used before. And then you can say, well, why is it doing better? What information is it using? And so this is an example, Pedong, where he plots different variables, temperature, moisture, and two different components of wind, eastward and northward. And so you can see in this relevance, the lighter the color, the more relevant it is to the prediction. So it cares a lot about moisture in the central square. Um, 
And U and V, it also cares about, and you can look in this particular case, what it's doing is it's learning the divergence of the flow, like du dx and dv dy. Um, whereas in other cases, we find it learns some things more like the vorticity. So I think there is some potential to learn some of the physics um, from what, what machine learning is doing. Okay, so just to conclude briefly then, uh, I argue that the inadequate representation of convection globe models is limiting our ability to understand how the hydrological cycle responds to climate change. Um, and that machine learning parameterizations have the potential to do better, uh, but it's important for them to be physically consistent and trained as accurately as possible. Oops. And then lastly, there's these frontiers, uh, including non-locality and space. Uh, the momentum transport, reduced precision, might improve efficiency and speed. And also this question of can we actually learn new physics from the machine learning parameterizations. So yeah, thanks very much for your attention. I'd be happy to take any questions you might have. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. O'Gorman, for this great talk. Um, if anyone has any questions, then what you can do is expand the attendee panel. There's a little button with like a hands icon and you can raise your hand and I will unmute you. Or you can um, just type in the chat that you wanna be unmuted or uh, you can type your question if you don't have a microphone. Question from Mike Evans. Mike, you're unmuted. I can't believe I figured out how to do that. Um, thank you for this talk. Um, so I, I have two related questions and they kind of, um, I guess, so the, the first one is um, you, you talked about the extrapolation to warmer climates and that you need to learn from warmer climates to be able to do that. Um, could you use simulations of um, past warmer climates, like for instance, um, the Pliocene? And, um, and related to that, I guess, is the question of um, the equilibration time scale that it takes thousands of years to kind of get to a, um, you know, a fully equilibrium climate response. Um, are there implications for machine learning to kind of get us there faster, more efficiently? Thank you. Yeah, thanks for those interesting questions. Um, yeah, so in terms of training, say a convection scheme for different climates, uh, yeah, I guess you could use past warmer climate. Um, I would guess it would probably work best that you would try and match whatever your target climate was. So if you were looking for projections for the next 100 years or something like that, you'd probably want to try and get as close to that as possible. But it does seem like you don't have to have an exact match. Um, but it does bring up a bigger question, which is, of course, we do use climate models to study things like past climates. And I think eventually there is a trade-off, really. Uh, we maybe can get more accuracy. We think we can get more accuracy with this kind of approach um, that would with traditional approaches. But you are sacrificing flexibility. So if you want to study past climates or exoplanets or different plants in our solar system, you may be better off using a fully full physics, you know, approach rather than machine learning. I think there's a flexibility accuracy trade off there, uh, but it's an interesting question. And then your second question, sorry, I'm blanking on it. Would you remind the, me again? What the, the second question was, um, to, you, you showed that plot from, I think, Stouffer's work that should take thousands of years, perhaps to fully equilibrate a doubled CO2. Um, forcing. So I was wondering if there are ways. I, I know there's like there's emulators, um, but I wonder if there's ways for um, for machine learning to help us to kind of get to where the equilibrium climate response is by only doing the transient simulation. Yeah, that's a great question. Uh, I actually haven't thought about it before. Yeah, I knew. I know there's this whole range of tricks for how to speed up equilibration, but I. Actually, yeah, I personally haven't seen that explored with machine learning, but I think it's a really good idea and it might be the kind of thing, you know, that you don't have to be perfect, right? You just have to get closer to the equilibrated state. So that seems like a great research. Topic. Yeah, we're just doing part of it and then it's easy to just uh, statistically extrapolate it because it's you know, close to linear at some point. Thank yeah. you. Let's see, can you unmute Thank me you. or other meet me? Yeah, I can I can unmute you, Mike. Mm -hmm. Okay, Mike, you are muted now. Um, so if anyone else has any questions, I can raise their hand. I did get a um, question in the chat. It's does machine learning improve processes related to radiative cooling and heating? 
Yeah, yeah, that's a great question. The so the first use of machine learning in this way was actually to emulate uh, radiation schemes. Um, you know, that's I think DCMW Lab did it, and also in, somewhere in France. I'm, I can't remember the exact citation. Um, and so that has long been uh, a, a thought, right? So you know, this could be a emulator. This could be a faster way to do it. I think in what I presented, it's a little bit differently. Um, there's a little bit of different thing going on, which is that we're taking, we are including radiation and, and what we're correcting for with our subgrid terms is kind of probably mostly the cloud radiation interaction, the subgrid variability in that. Uh, plus also perhaps some water vapor would be in there too. And so, yeah, so I, I, I guess the general answer I would say is it definitely has a lot of promise for that, uh, both kind of as just allowing you to use a high, a more straightforward kind of emulation approach where you're trying to use a more accurate uh, radiation, radiative transfer modeling that you can do faster with a, an emulator, or this kind of, you know, capturing the effects of subgrid variability, as I, I talked about here. But I think it's also a very challenging area, like when we look at how to put this parameterization we've been working on into a standard climate model you soon run into problems, a lot of them related to radiation, like how do you deal with the aerosol distributions? How do you deal with, um, yeah, just different components interacting. Um, and so, yeah, I think that's something we need, need a lot, you know, that area that needs a lot of focus. And it's not really clear how best this will all work out for the radiative part. Thank you. We also have a question from Jen Yu Key. I asked if they could be unmuted. Um, Jen Yu, if you want to be unmuted, you can just uh, let me know or raise your hand. I'll, I'll read your question for now. They asked, your work is focusing on processing processes in subgrids. Can machine learning be used to replace physical simulations of fluxes between subgrids in, in the global model? This may lead to a full machine learning based global model. Yeah, uh, yeah, that's a really good question. Yeah, I'm just focusing on this parameterization problem, but other groups are working exactly on just replacing, you know, an entire NWP model or an entire climate model with deep neural nets of different types. Um, and, you know, a few years, a couple of years ago, I guess the, the state of the art was it, it kind of it worked pretty well, but there might be problems with the seasonal cycle and things like that. Um, but I, there's been recent papers, and you know, it's something that you know is, is probably there's probably results I'm not even familiar with. This is a very fast moving area, and so I don't know exactly how far people have got with that. But you can you can definitely run it, um, and there are uh, benchmark tests that people are trying to you know work on. Um, you know, so to see how well they do and how far you can get. Um, so, yeah, so you can just say, I'm going to forget about, uh, you know, Navier Stokes, et cetera, and just try and predict everything. And so, whether that will be successful, I think one of the issues, it seems from reading these papers, is one issue is how much training data do you have? It seems that if you had a lot of training data, this would probably work, but do we have enough training data from reanalysis or various historical reanalysis to do a good job on this? That's not fully clear at this point. Thank you. Does anyone else have any questions? You can put something in the chat or raise your hand. Here's another chat question. How can we use machine learning to improve heavy precipitation under global warming? Uh, so, yeah, so that I guess that's what. So, I guess you mean the simulation of it. I, I'm guessing I'm not sure. Um, so, yeah, I think what I've been talking about is seems to work for that. I guess I would say that that seems to be somewhere where you can make a lot of improvement. Um, 1 issue with what I'm I've talked about so far, I think, is the you're still, let's say you're course graining up by a factor of 4 or 8 from a very high resolution model. Um, you might say, well, that's still too coarse for what I what I care about, right? So I want to, I'm doing some impacts research, or I'm, I'm trying to 
model risk for a company or a, a city or whatever, and they'll probably care about smaller scale um, precipitation. And so that's where I think another area of potential, you know, improvement would be in downscaling. How, to what extent can you use machine learning for downscaling? And can you kind of combine these approaches I've been talking about with, with downscaling approaches and training on different climates and so on uh, to do better and maybe make more credible, um, ultimately more, more credible downscaling where you, for example, if you train on these high resolution simulations and observations and in different climates for the simulations, perhaps you can make more credible downscaling that you know you you have confidence will work in different climates. One problem with statistical downscaling is you don't know if the relationship you've learned uh, or developed will work in a different climate. So I think there's some uh, potential there for advances using machine learning for, let's say, heavy precipitation at smaller scales that are very relevant for impacts. Thank you. Um, I'll give my last call for questions, but that's it for my queue. Oh, another one from Junyuki. Um, I'll just read it. So, are you using both measured and model simulated data sets to train the machine learning model? I think you have improved future prediction using simulations from global models, right? And also, Junyu, um, I can unmute you if you tell me it's okay. I just don't want to do it without consent. So, I'm not sure I fully got the question, but I, I think you asked, are we learning from Iris simulations only, or are we actually also learning from observations? Uh, we're, my group is only learning from um, Iris simulations. So we haven't tried learning from observations, but you know that is also of interest. Uh, other people have been trying it and part of a greater project that's partly aiming to um, learn from reanalysis increments and so on. But yeah, that has so far received less attention um, although I think it's certainly worth, worth looking at. Thanks. Also, um, Julie Lysisano has asked to be unmuted. And, oh, I'm sorry, I'm trying to find them in my list. Okay, you are now unmuted. Okay, yeah, thank you. It's a nice talk, Dr. Brown. Uh, I have a quick question. Uh, is it possible if you use for downscaling because of the computer limitations, say, uh, let's say only in the Western Pacific or Indonesian region where the convection is located? And then can we run it in, in let's say, to the uh, cluster computer, for example, or just a small computer? And what is the limitation if we run the, uh, for cluster using cluster rather than a supercomputer? Sorry, so I didn't quite catch the start. Do you say four times scaling? Are you talking about the coarse graining factor or uh, something else? No, it's uh, downscaling. Sorry, if we so, suppose, like, say, we rather than running for the globe, we just running for the Indonesian region where the convection is uh, strong. You know, uh, can can yeah. we do that? And then it's possible just using cluster rather than using the supercomputer. Ah, okay. Yeah, I mean, I certainly yeah. What the model I was showing. Um, uh, the SAM model was on a quasi-global domain, so it wasn't really global, right? Uh, that one, when it's in its course mode with the neural net parameterization, I can run it on my own desktop computer with, you know, 16 cores or something like that. So, yeah, once once you go to the coarser resolution, you can with the machine learning parameterization, or I guess other parameterizations. Um, yeah, so I, I, you know, I focused on the global models and I focused on deep convection, but hopefully these kind of approaches could be used also for regional scale simulations or other processes, right? As you resolve more, you, you there's other processes you want to do better on the shallow convection and so on. So, yeah, I, I think it should be a more general approach. Currently, it's easiest to do this for, um, I think, for deep convection because you can it's it's at the stage where you can resolve it for short simulations, you know, or you know, for a year perhaps in a global model. And that makes life much easier. If you're trying to learn from LES simulations in much higher resolution, for example, um, then you have the question, well you can learn from a LES simulation in a certain region, but how do you know you have enough training data to cover all the possibilities? And so that gets a little bit harder. Okay, thank you. Sure. 
Thanks for the question. Okay, well, that is um, all that I have, all the questions that I have. Um, so thank you everyone for attending. Thank you, Dr. O'Gorman for giving us this great talk. Um, we'll have a recording of this up. I see there's already some questions about that, um, probably by the end of the week. Um, but everyone else, please join us next week as our seminar series continues. Thank you, Professor. Thank you. Okay, thank you. I just wanted to keep the keep it up just in case there was anything last minute. But I'm going to end the event now. But thank you. I thank you guys. Okay. Thanks, Cassandra. Thanks, John. Take care. Have a good day. <laughs>